No matter where you stand on the race updates for Mordekainen's Monsters of the Multiverse, they're here. But only if you want to drop $150 for one book with a ton of reprints and two books you probably already own. As usual with any change that comes to 5th edition that challenges the legacy of the game, it's met with the usual hot takes, passionate posts, and bad faith arguments that you can find on various YouTube channels, Reddit posts, forums, or probably in the comments section of this video. While I find the mechanical updates exciting and see them as a positive thing for the game, breathing life into player options that are often deemed as not optimal or viable, regardless of whether that's true or not, these changes convey a story and are our tools to navigate the world we are playing in. So in this video, I'm going to take a look at how Mordenkainen's Monsters of the Multiverse impacts the narrative of the entire game and take a look at specific options that got a huge overhaul and how those updates transform their story. Hey everyone, welcome to Dungeoneers Pack, this is Josh and thank you for watching. Two things before jumping into it, I want to give a huge thank you to King Jackal and the fine folks over at DD Leaks subreddit for collecting all the info and putting it into a single place to read. You can find a link to the post in the description below. And the last thing is that anything said in this video is all my opinion and don't take things as 100% fact. I'm only interpreting the information collected and providing my thoughts on the matter. Many of the changes brought to the races in Mordenkainen's Monsters of the Multiverse were mechanical updates to align them with Wizards' current design philosophy introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and balance out the power level in relation to the newer race options introduced in the 2021 books. Many of the race options had quality of life changes, but throughout every option, cultural traits were replaced with biological or magical options. This is a big change to the story of D&D races that I find is a good one. By removing these cultural traits in mass, a playgroup is free to interpret the options as they see fit in their game. While the table could have I've always done this, it's now incentivized and supported in the game. I like this change because now the core story for races in the grand scheme of D&D is no longer tied to one specific setting. Despite the success of many Forgotten Realms campaign books, the lore from that setting was baked into the core books of the game that didn't translate well to the growing list of settings being added to 5th edition. The big criticism behind this change is that the removal of these cultural traits removes story or makes all these race options bland or similar. I disagree in regards to the mechanics. These changes don't do that. Each option presented has a wide range of features that make them distinct, but I believe the criticism does have value when it comes to the story. While I agree with removing these traits from the core rulebooks of the game, I don't agree with removing them from the game entirely. Culture, when done right, brings value. It is another way for playgroups to interact and immerse themselves into the world. They bring a richness making these worlds feel lived in. In Wizards attempt to remove the game from problematic representation, which I agree with and applaud them for, it feels like a half measure. I may be speaking for myself, but I feel players want options that are supported mechanically to help them represent their character in the setting they are playing in. If they were to give players cultural traits, they should be found in setting books, either being variant race options, expanded background options, or a whole new system entirely. Wizards of the Coast just needs to do the work. If you feel this way or disagree with me, let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear what you have to say, but please be respectful. There are too many races to cover in a single video, so I'm going to highlight a few that I feel have drastic changes that expand or change the story behind them. Goblinoids are by far my favorite race option in the game, in large part to being a dirty red player in Magic the Gathering. Goblins, Hobgoblins, and Bugbear traits represented their aggressive and militaristic nature. An overarching change for all three Goblinoids is the addition of the Fae Ancestry trait, tying them all to the Feywild, bringing back a piece of their fairy tale origins that was lost in the current edition. While Goblins are often depicted and played as chaotic and comical, this did not extend to other Goblinoids, as their traits suggested a grim and dangerous persona. The addition of Fae Ancestry changes this, adding a sense of enchantment, whimsy, and mischief. This single racial trait brings a light-hearted aspect to the Bugbear and Hobgoblin, broadening their spectrum of personalities and morality. With this tie to the Feywild, we can make the assumption of good-natured goblinoids existing alongside their usually depicted militaristic counterparts possibly being at odds with each other. Feywild goblinoids can see their material plane counterparts as wicked and cruel, while the traditional goblinoids see their Feywild cousins as pure chaos, entirely at the whims of their emotions. The Hobgoblin receives a complete overhaul that exemplifies this change. Fey Gifts gives them a supportive option that has them tap into their Fey magic, but despite the name, could easily be seen as tactical actions taken by the militaristic faction. Saving Face is renamed to Fortune from the Many, which changes the flavor of a leader attempting to prevent the perception of weakness in front of their peers to them instead finding strength in the bonds they make with their allies. This change makes the option neutral which can play into that might makes right mindset depicted by Hopgoblins, but also suggests the Hopgoblin is much more social than their goblinoid cousins. They find strength in their relationships. The Fey identity has the potential to create an internal conflict for the Hobgoblin. A Hobgoblin character could look to discover their ties to the Fey Wild, putting them at odds with their goblinoid clan. This self-discovery propels them to a life of adventure, but they struggle with a sense of guilt for abandoning their clan. 
Another idea is that a Feywild goblin finds themselves in the material plane to find that their people are under a tyrannical ruler. Being an embodiment of freedom, they look for the means to liberate goblinoids from their oppression. The Kenku updates massively changed their identity. Originally, they were flightless, unable to speak in their own voice, or have the ability to create. These traits tied to a curse have been removed. In game, these traits represented an existence of trial and hardship stemming from tragedy. Out of game, these lead to players being more of a meme or just blatantly disrupting the game, often subverting the themes presented in the race. With the new traits, Kenko can now speak and have the ability to create. Removing the old traits moves the Kenko away from their former gimmicky identity to being much closer to the crows they are inspired by. Expert duplication replaces expert forgery. The original trait only allowed for Kenku to create copies of writings that someone else wrote. Now they can make exact replicas of writing or craft work made by themselves or others. Kenku recall replaces Kenku training, gaining proficiency in two skills of your choice and giving yourself advantage on a skill check you have proficiency with. These new traits suggest that Kenku have a thirst for knowledge, are highly perceptive, and can accomplish their tasks with consistency and precision. Arguably, Kenku could very well take up a similar role to other tinkerer races like the gnome. I can see them having a place in a setting where a faction of Kenku are exploring the bounds of magic and artifice. Not only are they able to replicate arcane marvels, but now they have this newfound ability to create and are able to innovate as well. Kenku rogue characters are pretty common and the new traits double down on this. The only change I could see that could impact a setting is that Kenku are no longer just part of a thieves guild or a mercenary band. They could very well be in charge of them. Players looking to play with the former trait restrictions can still do it for settings that include that lore. Having speaking and cursed Kenku creates a tension between the two while putting a new spin on the idea. Either faction could be the cause of the curse. The two factions of Kenku could have had a civil war which resulted in one of them no longer being able to create or speak. Or, a small population have become affected by the curse and it's up to the Kenku hero to discover the cause and cure to prevent it from spreading to the rest of their peoples. Just like the Hobgoblin, Kobold's got a full rework. The Kobold is often depicted as crafty and cowardly with its strength coming from working in large numbers. These traits were played up for comedic effect and reflected in the pack tactics and grovel cower and beg traits. Both of these traits, in addition to sunlight sensitivity, were replaced with Draconic Cry and Cobalt Legacy. Pack tactics is a beloved trait and epitomizes the Cobalt's belief in strength in numbers. Even without this powerful trait, the general idea is found in Draconic Cry, tying it to the Draconic lineage while adding a viable but inferior in comparison replacement. Draconic Cry also acts as a replacement for grovel cower and beg, and is flexible in its flavor still allowing players to be cowardly, but for those looking to play against the trope, could represent your Cobalt being courageous, attempting to put fear into their enemies or rallying your allies. Cobalt Legacy doubles down on the Draconic Ancestry. Having players pick between being crafty, brave, or a cantrip, the craftiness option plays into the traditional Cobalt trope, which was missing in the previous version. Defiance adds a new aspect to the race that discards the cowardly depictions. This newfound bravery opens up the spectrum of personalities allowing for a Cobalt that is courageous and willingly puts themselves on the front line. Draconic Sorcery highlights a race's lineage which could be used as an enormous plot hook for your character. Your character could set off on their adventure trying to uncover the nature of this draconic magic. Overall, this new Cobalt doesn't make any drastic changes to its story. Instead, they just expand on it. Many of the traits help represent aspects of the Cobalt lore that were missing in the Volos version. Cobalt Legacy does a lot of the heavy lifting, having options that play into the crafty and magical Cobalt tropes. Whether you want to be brave, cowardly, or somewhere in between, the support for them is there now. A big concern regarding all the new race updates is if they will replace the previously released versions. The answer is yes and no. This isn't a cop-out answer. These new updates are not an errata. Wizards has been really unclear on what exactly this release is as the entire book is a mix of reprinted material with updates, but there seems to be no current indication that they will be issuing an errata document anytime soon. There was no fear of this when Wizards introduced new Dragonborn options and Fizzband's Treasure of Dragons as they were treated as new standalone options. This book appears to be doing the same. The folks at D&D Beyond also came out saying they will not be changing the versions from previous books if you own them on their platform. This supports these being additional options and not replacements, but keep in mind, D&D Beyond is not owned by Wizards and could be making this decision on their own. But why did I say yes in my confusing answer? Because at the end of the day, what you and your players do at the table will affect your game more than whatever Wizards of the Coast decides to do. My assumption is that tables will allow all available options with players gravitating towards the ones that make them feel good. Given that many of these options offer quality of life and balance changes compared to previous editions, players will decide to choose them no longer picking the older versions, thus making the new options functional replacements. And with that said, I want to hear from you. Do you like the new race options from Mordekanian's Monsters of the Multiverse? Let me know down in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like. And if you want to see more content like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. All right, I'm out of here. Have a good one.